Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to the Gould Standard, a regular arts magazine brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. We bring you conversations with remarkable people from across the world of the arts, and if music, reading, theater, dance, visual art, and film are part of your essential soul therapy in these troubled times, you've come to the right place. Be sure to press like, share, and subscribe, add your comments, pose your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. And to get more great content, please pay a visit to our website, www.glengould.ca. And if you're feeling so inclined, you can make a donation. We are a registered Canadian charity. Now today, we'll be speaking with and I think this is no exaggeration, one of the truly outstanding actors of our day. Regina Saskatchewan-born Tatiana Maslany exploded into the public spotlight with her landmark portrayal of multiple roles, the clone Sestras, in the hit Canadian TV series Orphan Black. But she was already a veteran with appearances in more than 20 films, numerous TV shows in Canada, including Heartland, Being Erica, and the adaptation of Margaret Atwood's The Robber Bride. But it was the contemporary sci-fi dramatic series Orphan Black that proved to be a turning point, not only reflecting our widespread anxieties about the impact of meddling with the human genome, but the series also explored a vast range of themes around women's empowerment, love, sexuality, sisterhood, and community. In the slam dunk obvious decision of the year, Tatiana was recognized with the Primetime Emmy Award in 2016 for Best Actress in a Dramatic Series. And in its five seasons on the air, Orphan Black created a passionate following uh, among young women in the LGBTQ community and among people who just happen to get off on transcendent acting. Tatiana has gone on to score accolades in such films as Woman in Gold, Kaz and Dylan, Two Lovers and a Bear, and last year's Pink Wall, as well as on Broadway, starring opposite Brian Cranston in the fourth wall-shattering production of Network. Most recently, she's been featured as the evangelist, Sister Alice, in HBO's Perry Mason. And if that weren't enough, Tatiana recently took part in The Jury, for the 13th Glenn Gould Prize, which is how we got to meet her. And it selected Abenaki filmmaker, artist, and musician Alanis Obamsuin as our 13th laureate. With a resume like that, it's no wonder that people have started naming things after Tatiana, whether it's a street in Regina or Amy Schumer's dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tatiana, welcome. It's so good to have you uh, with us today. Uh, thank you. I am neither the street nor the dog. This is oh, that's good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you on screen and I can attest. Yes. Neither, <laughs> neither street nor dog. So you grew up in Regina and neither of your parents was professionally in the arts. How and at what point in, in your childhood did you decide that you wanted to be a creative, to use mm -hmm. the, the fashionable term nowadays? Yeah, I don't know that it was ever a choice. It just was the way that I was. And my my brother, who's three years younger than I am, Daniel, he and I just were always making things, whether it was plays, like I think a lot of kids do, or using the camcorder that like the family had to make movies or writing something or making music, whatever it was, there was always something that we were doing. And it just felt like uh, a natural extension of being a kid, but never was like a concerted choice. But I started to audition for community theater just out of ex interest in performing and a natural attention for wanting attention, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure that was like a, a big part of it at a time, though I have a very strange relationship with that. But, but yeah, it was just a natural evolution of being a kid. And it just, sports was not my thing. I was tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was not good at catching a uh, football, so I had to do the other thing. You you could have been a tiny gymnast. I could have been a very small gymnast. I was a very small ba ballet dancer for a time, but then that hurts. That just hurt. <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> I, I have it on, on good authority. But dance is still important to you and movement. Yeah. Does that become part of the touchstone for you in developing characters? Yeah, it it, it was always part of a creative expression of some kind or some kind of a tapping into 
a different way of being or feeling in my body. But it really became solidified for me as a technique for character creation when I started working on Orphan Black. And that was because I had to delineate so many different characters. Music felt like a way into an internal rhythm that I could tap mm -hmm. into that was different than my own and it was different than the previous character. So whether the, the beat was something that was pulsed, like a quick pace that would then move my body in a different way or move my brain in a different way, my thoughts would happen in a different pattern than if I was listening to something a bit more cinematic and internal. So it, it was a fun kind of really mechanical almost, but also emotional way to delineate the characters. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Now you were also, and, and I think you still are, deeply involved with improv, right? I, what, I grew up doing, I did French improv when I was a kid. And then I did high school improv through the Canadian Improv Games, which is an amazing thing that exists and I hope continues to exist. But And then I did long form improv when I graduated high school with right. that you, company. You were a general fool. I was a general fool. Did you, <laughs> I was did you, general fool. <laughs> did you get to be a general right away or were you like a major fool to start with? And then... I was a minor fool to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> but that really is interesting because obviously you, anytime you go out on stage, there's ri risk taking, but there's not, nothing like the risk taking of, of improv. And it actually um, reminds me, I've got it here somewhere, of actually a quote that's really stuck with me forever from another one of our Glenn Gould Prize laureates, the uh, director Robert Lepage. Uh -huh. And he said, and if you can relate this to improv, it's a good thing to celebrate excellence, but I think it's important to define what excellence is. For me, excel the excellence of artists should not be measured only by their successes and achievements, but also by their courage and the capacity to constantly put themselves in danger. Trial, error, and at times even public humiliation are as much a part of the process of defining one's uniqueness. Does that sort of resonate in terms of improv? Yes, absolutely. And that's that's the thing that is so addictive of about doing improv because it always puts you on that edge where you could where you are on the verge of humiliation because you could totally blame. But then there's also that thing of being on the precipice almost gives you this permission to just fall and fly because you don't have a safety net. So there's a freedom there at the same time as it's like deeply risky. And I love that quote. And I think it's why, and I, I get, get choked up even talking about it, but watching really amazing improv from the audience even. Right. Because you're so present as an audience member because you have to watch every moment and you're just as important to that thing that's being created on stage if the if the players are really listening it, and it's then, a one time right? only totally. it cannot really be repeated i always wonder with improv how it is when you're having an argument and you come up with the absolutely perfect comeback two minutes too late yes. do you ever have that like, every day of my uh, life yeah yeah but, but i know <laughs> you, you must be totally concentrated in the moment but at some point, a little farther down, it's like, why didn't I say that? Yeah. You know? I think also because in an argument, probably like your defense mechanisms are coming up, right? So your survival right. instincts come up and they're not necessarily going to be the most, they're not the most clever. And I think sometimes improv also exists in that place that it's not really about like how clever you are. It's about how you take something that is nothing and you imbue it with as much importance as if it were written in a play to be that way. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like yeah. You endow it with stakes and you endow it with emotion and you endow it with all of that yeah. stuff. Total investment. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I did want to go back to this idea that you were a uh, an overnight sensation 15 years in the making is right. in, in a classic way because you'd already been on in about 20 movies and dozens of TV shows. And some of those were actually very, very prominent roles. Some of them much smaller roles. You were even in a, a George Romero zombie movie. Did you get your brains eaten by any chance? No, I almost became a zombie. I start to become a zombie and then I get shot. And I, so uh, I zombie for, th for zero seconds. 
Oh, you I missed know. your big break. I yeah. know. I was like almost dead. It was such yeah. a, oh my God, it was such a joy. It was so much fun. <laughs> I, I asked about the sort of the run up to Orphan Black a little bit because it seems to me that to take on that many roles in a series, an extended series in which you, you really are the centerpiece, really must require a lot of preparation and seasoning. And do you feel that all of the work that you'd done up until then helped you to have the combination of resources and resilience to take that step? Yeah, I feel like I, I really believe in the right, the role that is that you're required to play in that moment is going to come to you. So what you're willing to to do will come to you because you're curious about it or you're ready. But I also think it was a huge challenge and was also, it was the dream for me because it wasn't being one character for seven seasons on a procedural that I just wouldn't have had the patience for. Like, I'm just not, my attention span isn't, I don't have the attention span for that. Mm -hmm. So the improv that I'd done, the dance, the voice work, the Meisner, the scene study, the whatever it was, that all felt like it was uh, available to me then. Yeah. Right. But yeah, and not to to gloss over all the work you did prior to Orphan Black. And I think really from the very beginning, there was something extraordinary. I mean, one of the, the early things that you did that really made an impression on me was when you played an, another Tatiana, the <laughs> speaking through the diary of, of a dead girl, a victim of sex trafficking in David Cronenberg's Eastern Promises, <laughs> even though that's a voice only role. I really felt, and it's a film with a lot of big performances, I still felt that your contribution really provided the quiet soul at the core of the movie. And even as there were scenes with violence and action and so on, it really kept the film back to coming back to what it was about. What was that experience like? Did you work closely with Cronenberg? Yeah, I. It, that feels like it was so long ago. And I can, I can what I do remember of that time was getting to... First off, I worked with John Nellis, who is a dialect coach who then I worked with on Orphan Black as well. So he and I have worked together a few times now, and, mm -hmm. and that was the first time that we worked together on the dialect. And then I remember, I think it was like four hours in a, a voiceover studio with David, who was like super patient, gentle, like just really easing me into it no pressure, just like time and space to try things and to find things and really emotionally driven. So it was, and of course I was just like, he's like sitting there on the couch. It was just yeah. so real. It's just wild. Yeah. He, it looks like David Cronenberg. <laughs> he he, he like does, but I think everyone always expects him to be terribly strange because of, you know, the subject matter of some of his films. And I, I remember yeah. an interview with him where, you know, someone said, like, you have heads exploding and people being possessed by television sets. And <laughs> did you have a really terrible, traumatic childhood? And he said, no, I grew up, I was a normal kid in Scarborough. I, I guess like when I was 12, my dog died. That was pretty <laughs> tough, but yeah, that, that was it. Anyway, yeah. an another really significant milestone for you was Ruby in Grown Up Movie Star. Mm -hmm. And for that one, you won the World Dramatic Special Jury Prize for Breakout Performance at Sundance in 2010. You must have felt like you were on top of the world at, at that point and everything was going to be smooth sailing from that point on. What what <laughs> happened after that? I take it it wasn't quite so clear cut. <laughs> it was not. No, I like went to Sundance and had the most amazing time and was just high on the experience. And, and then on the back of that win, went to uh, L.A. for the first time to do that thing and ended up not getting any jobs bombing in every room I went in. It was just not it's a it's such a funny thing that you get an award or something and then there's an assumption that you have something figured out. Yeah. But really, it's like that award said more about what it was to be on that set with Adriana Meggs and with Sean Doyle and Mark O'Brien and Johnny Harris and these people who were just so creative. And it was such a safe, wonderful place to create and to play. Mm -hmm. And then the award stuff is like, whatever. It's beside the point. But I, I think also there's a kind of a latitude to be a 
non-typical star in Canadian film that maybe with the the size of the budgets and the mindset of the of the casting directors and all the rest of it doesn't quite so much exist when you head off to LA. Yeah, and I think that at the time that was still a very rigid sort of aesthetic or whatever. There was something that people expected of a leading a leading lady or man that now is beginning to change in this way that's so exciting to me. And at that time, I think I felt, I knew I wasn't like that. I knew I was different and I loved, I loved being not right. I prided myself on that at the same time as I tried to conform to become that. But there was a part of me that innately knew I'm more interested in this thing over here, which is yeah. weirder and more darker or there's more question marks around it than certainties. Yeah, absolutely. What is to become of Hollywood if they start making films about human beings? Can you imagine? Oh, it would be a uh, world coming to an end. Huh? We might all feel very seen suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have that. What a man. Absolutely meant. not. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we might not have insecurities anymore about being odd. Exactly. Now, the, moving on to Orphan Black, because obviously any project that is five years of your life and allows you to explore such a range, that's going to be a big piece of any career. I'm assuming that it started off as a an audition opportunity like any other, and that you were one among quite a few actors who got the call. When did you start to think that you might have a, a shot and, and did you know from the beginning that this was going to be something special? Yeah, as soon as I read it and read the sort of premise, I, I felt like this was such a once in a lifetime opportunity as an artist to get to try this. And it was more even, I really felt just excited to audition. I would have been devastated not to get it, but I was just mm -hmm. excited to get into the room once I got past the first round of auditions and went to the screen test, which was like five of us trying out this part and got to go in front of the producers and stand there and change in front of them into these five different iterations of these characters. That was enough for me at the time. Like I was just mm -hmm. excited to get to do that. I was excited that it was such a, an unheard of challenge that it hadn't been done before, except in certain contexts, but it really did feel special and it felt such a chance to play in a way that um, gave into the artifice of performance as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's a performance, like that there's like a gimmick so you can lean into it that you can't when you're just doing a straight drama. It's a different yep. thing. Mm -hmm. So in the audition, you did Sarah and Allison and Helena. No. And, no, you I didn't, didn't do Helena. Know, Helena I didn't know existed until I was on set of episode two. Okay. Yes, there's a there's like a serial killer coming up next episode. What do you what do you think she should be? <laughs> but, um, so Kasima, uh, Kasima, Sarah Asbeth, uh -huh. Allison, and and just Beth or something like that. Or it was like, oh, okay. or maybe it was those four. I think that was it. Yeah. So the main accent that you, you needed to do there was Sarah's. So you spent a lot of time being Cockney leading <laughs> up to that, right? That's right. Would have, would have done my mom's uh, heart proud. Oh, was she? Um, was she uh, yeah, both my parents. Yeah. Where from? My mother from London and my dad from Liverpool. Oh, no way. I lived in Liverpool for a couple months. Ah, great. Well, my father was a lifelong fan of, of Everton, and consequently, he died of a broken heart. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, what strikes me about Orphan Black is, yes, it's great science fiction. It's great adventure. It has the, the concept of a shadowy organization that seemingly menaces people's lives and that it's, they're powerless to resist. All, all of those are really strong features in terms of the plot, but it's really a show with an enormous heart that uses that science fiction artifice to, you know, illuminate this incredible range of relationships and issues, identity and representation, the loss of freedom and agency for individuals in a corporate dominated environment, sisterhood, community, love, healing and acceptance. And it 
were you surprised at the level of passion that the show was received by it, and especially in the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I think I feel like we knew it was if we were talking about identity, we knew that we were exploring things that were relevant to like cis, cisgender women specifically in terms of autonomy, body, the rights to own your own body. But then when we came out the first season and, and went to Comic-Con and felt this wave of love from a lot of queer kids, gay, straight, trans, like all over the board, it was just really enlightening in terms of what that kind of representation means, similar to what you and I are talking about in terms of what if Hollywood actually represented people, right, uh, human right. beings. Like, I'm just so excited about the things that are possible now mm -hmm. that change is being like forced <laughs> finally right. like we're finally stepped into or whatever but there's so many stories that we haven't told that vitally make people feel seen and make people feel like they have a voice and they are part of a world that right. i think especially right now what i've been feeling so much and what this the jury was helpful in terms of was like that community, which I think is where artists and where a lot of queer people get their sense of themselves and their sense of their work or their passion or their love or whatever is in reflection with each other. And these communities that we build where we go, oh yeah, I think that way too, or that's so interesting. I've never seen it that way. When you build your identity around what you're acquiring through these communities. And I think that support, especially right now when we're so, so separate is really vital. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in a way it's encouraging that so many creative independent projects can exist more power to the big franchises. Cause as long as Hollywood is rolling in dough from them, they can afford to take a little fling on creative and edgy independent projects. But there is something in a way, personally subversive about Orphan Black because we live in an increasingly individualistic world. You come from a place which was the birthplace of democratic socialism in, mm -hmm. in Canada, Regina, yeah. the Regina Manifesto and the, the CCF, mm -hmm. which is really all about strength through community. And the idea that we're atomized cogs in a big machine separated and made part of an involuntary diaspora. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's being done with them. Most of them don't know that they have a fatal disease yeah. in their future. And the way they are able to learn to trust and love and reclaim their agency by coming together is both inspiring and moving, but it's also subversive in the current social and political context they also they come together because of their differences because their differences are actually the thing that makes them feel connected they're va like they're so vastly different they've been raised differently they've they see the world differently they have different privileges they or oppressions but there's a commonality to their fight for their survival and for their right to live right to exist mm -hmm. and that keeps that comes back to this idea of like why do we march in the streets when not necessarily like my white rights are being like infringed on in any way but what's the common goal that we're all striving towards in terms of equality what i loved about it was that these characters were all kind of tropes that you would see female characters they would look like this they would speak like this and you make a judgment oh, okay that's that person i can put that person in this box but what we sought to do was open up that box and go wait what's actually inside why does that trope exist what is right. that trope protecting so yeah it was really it was a lot of fun, right. lot of fun. and that really i think you answered one of my curious questions because i I heard you in an interview saying that Allison was one of your favorite characters, and yet she seems in some ways the most unlike you, someone who is, at least from at the start, a an absolute archetypal suburbanite living the life of quiet desperations in the three suburban bees, bingos, barbecues, and, and bake sales. And so was it her growth out of that 
box that inspired you most about her? I think it, yeah. And I think also that she was just so wrong all the time. She, <laughs> she was so adamant that she was right, but she was always wrong. <laughs> and I uh, love that about her. It's like she, she upheld this idea and a lot of cis, cis women, trans women can relate to this, but this idea of perfection, this idea of perfect femininity, whatever that is, takes so many forms, but that kind of rigid heldness, a whole a holding, and then was really crumbling inside and was right. really the biggest mess of all and really was making the most kind of egregious messes that you know, <laughs> yes. <ever. laughs> yes, yes. And, she killed and, a lot of know. people. <laughs> she, I, I wonder who she voted for in 2016. I, I don't even want it. I don't even want to talk to her about that. I hope she regrets her choice. <laughs> right. I should say we are four days away from the U.S. elections. There is a certain extra frisson oh, in the air, a certain crackle of anxiety. I don't anyway, even know what to, yeah, I can't even imagine what's going to happen. Yeah, it, it'll be a different world on Wednesday yeah. or maybe even possibly worse. But Another thing about Orphan Black that must have been a special challenge for you is the complexity. First of all, it's complex from a plot development point of view, keeping the dyad free from regeneration and all the other layers <laughs> of and and the the lineages of character. But it's also by the time you were done, eight, nine, ten, I, I lost count. Sets of of personal histories and sets of relationships and as well as just the affects of the character. How did you keep all of that straight in your mind? It became a muscle really. And it really, it really continued to be what I've always, I think because we were doing so much so quickly because it's Canadian television. So it moves at right. the fastest pace possible, no time. I had to trust my instincts in the moment. I'm not a plot person at all. I I watch, I've seen movies, certain movies over 50 times, and I'm still figuring out what's happening in it, but I'm so enthralled by how it's happening and how alive the performances are or how uh, emotional it is or whatever it is. What's, the, what's a 50 time movie for you? Uh, a woman under the influence, oh, wow. of the dead, there will be blood. Like, honestly, a woman under the influence, I'm still like, oh, she went, oh, okay. I see. <laughs> like, and I can, and I've watched them so many times. Wow. It, it's not about the one, two, three, four, five of it, the linear of it. It's something about the human experience in it. Absolutely. Oh, you know what I mean? For sure. For so, sure. Similarly, when I approach something that's super plot heavy, I obviously do that work, but I also then have to let go of it and trust that at the same time, an editor might move this scene and move it over there or take this breath out of there. And then suddenly it means something t totally different. Right. The only right. thing I can really take care of is in the moment, listening to that, my scene partner right. and being alive with, with who the character is. Yep. And there are script consultants on set to make sure that yeah. Totally, <laughs> who'd be like, "Why are you furious at that person? They just proposed to you or something like that." <laughs> uh, speaking of scripts and script development, did you have the space to improvise at all, or was it you have to keep everything within your whatever it is forty-two minute framework per episode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as much as. I, I I always think there's space for it. Sometimes directors don't want you to do it, but there are certain dynamics in that show, Sarah and Felix. Uh, so with Jordan Gavaris, that was always crackling with improv. Uh, Allison and Donnie, so myself and Christian Brune, like yeah. we played so much. So the cameras would roll for 30 seconds after a take because we would just not, we wouldn't shut up. Or mm -hmm. we would do some ad lib before to get into the scene or whatever it was. There was always... There's always space for it. And, and those relationships come across as being particularly real and nuanced. Mm -hmm. And you sense the history of the characters together. So it, it obviously it paid off. Yeah. So back to Helena. And I, I realize <laughs> in some ways she's the most extreme character in many ways. She goes from being this shadowy serial killer. And then you find out about the 
unbelievable abuse that she suffered as a child with the nuns and her growth in some ways into being able to love and embrace motherhood and her sisters. That is also, in a way, the most extreme arc in in the show. How much of a struggle was that for you to make that real? I feel like the second that I put the wig on, in the first few episodes that we see Helena, she's straight up serial killer. Like she's yeah. an animal. She's a creature. And she's been programmed to kill. Yeah. But putting the wig on and having this, the makeup, I looked in the mirror and I immediately like burst into tears because I could just feel some, I felt her and I didn't know what it was. And I just knew that there was a deep well of pain there that was screaming out and that's why she was so violent and why she was so angry and this loneliness and this otherness that she had that she embodied it was always instinctive to me that there was another that there was a shadow to her that was something else there was a yearning for something she just didn't have the skill set she just didn't have the tools so she would go about it in strange ways and I knew that sex and violence were intermixed for some reason, that there was a there was an arousal that happened when she was violent, that there was a shame around that came from the religious sort of thing. But it was like this Tom Waits became like a touchstone for me in terms of music for her. Oh, awesome. I, I love Tom Waits. Me too. And I would yeah. sing his stuff to find her voice to I remember like laying in bed and singing everything you can think of is true in this Ukrainian accent to find her kind of growly sort of bass. The earth dies screaming uh, yes. from Bone Machine, right? Yes, exactly. Like With just creature. And so for me, she that was who she was. And, and at the same time, he has this beautiful lightness and this romance to his music too, and this sort of whimsy to it and this kind of childish, I don't know. So there, it really felt true to me to have her. That's fantastic. Another part of the magic of the series, I think, is the its treatment of the LGBTQ relationships because they're nuanced, they're stereotype free. I think as much as one can be on uh, in a television context. And for example, the relationship between Casina, Casima, and Delphine is. It's just a beautiful romance. It has its ups, it has its downs. There's struggle for, for trust. And and I think that must also be extremely comforting and validating for for people in the community. The clone club really feels like it is in itself uh, sisterhood, brotherhood, personhood that draws an enormous amount of strength. It must feel like a really special privilege to have been part of the force of activating that community to, to come into being. Totally. And I think so much of creating a TV show or whatever is done in this like vacuum of you're just trying to get it done and you're just trying to be make sure that it's as good as it can be. But when you get to have a dialogue with the fans where you really do feel their their like their fan art or their their delving into the science of the show or their appreciation of the LGBTQ character storylines or their critique of it as well. And you mm -hmm. start to feel that dialogue. It's it changes the way that going to work feels and it changes the it's no longer done in this vacuum that doesn't take into consideration what the world is. And as much as it's like and I think that's something that I navigate as an artist is like how do I stay true to an impulse or to a purity of creation outside of the noise of outside? And how do I also incorporate that, not noise, but that feedback from the outside that actually gives me so many more clues about what I could be doing? But also, you have not only given them a great story and great characters that they love, but you have contributed to something very important in their lives. And obviously you've received awards as an ally and and from seeing at least one of your acceptance speeches, it, it clearly meant a lot to you on a deeply human level to and it's the kind of thing that an actor, an artist may may go through an entire career without experiencing to to become part of people's lives that way. Yeah, it's it's such a privilege and it's such an honor and it's 
it gives an importance to showing up that feels so, I feel so lucky to have that. I don't, I don't even know what to say about it, but yeah. Right. Does that give you not just in the aftermath of the series, but also moving forward in your choice of roles and how you carry yourself as a human being, some added sense of responsibility, some extra sense that there's a significance to what you do that you have to continue to express? I don't know the responsibility is the feeling, but it's like a a consciousness. It's, it doesn't feel like a burden. It feels like a, oh yeah, there's something more interesting to explore. What's the interesting thing to explore? What's something, and I've always followed this too as an artist, is what's the scariest thing I could do next? Or the Uh thing I haven't done yet? Or the thing that when I read it, I'm like, huh, what? Like more question marks than certainties again. And I think having people watch and there's certain kind of commentary that I don't try to really look into or buy into or whatever. Right. It's There are certain things that really mean something to me. Feminism is an important one and LGBTQ issues, rights, um, stories. Those are the things that really resonate for me. And if I can, they're, they're the things that light me up. So if I can explore them, then I'm so lucky to get to do that. Exactly. On, on a slightly lighter note, you've described yourself as having been a nerdy kid growing up and <laughs> comics may have had something to do with that. What's it like having a lifetime welcome mat out for you at, at uh, every Comic-Con from now till the end of time. <laughs> it's nuts. I didn't even know Comic-Con existed because I was so out of touch with <laughs> anything. Yeah. But yeah, it's like that experience is the most exciting because all my favorite comedians are there. All my favorite uh, animators are there. Voice actors like those. That's my stuff. That, that, that's great. And uh, clearly I have this sort of fantasy image of you basically getting the full Helena gear on and sneaking (laughs) in as a fan. (laughs) Do you think you could pass? I'd love that. I'd love to do that. If anyone spots you, it's it's easy. (laughs) It's actually you. That's great. Yeah. You've also described how in finding the characters, getting the, the, some physical elements, not just the movement, but also the makeup, the hair design, possibly some sort of, a particular object that they relate to, that it really is building the, 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 the character from the outside in, which is really interesting to me that so much of your concept could be informed or beginning to inhabit the role starts with just when this character looks in the mirror, what does she see? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's more physical first. And so it's like instincts and responses. So if I'm seeing something in the mirror, and having an emotional response to it, that tells me something about what's happening inside this person. Right, Um, right. Or that gives me a clue as to like why they might look this way or what this defense is. Because I find aesthetic to be so curious and so exciting. It can be like denigrated as being flimsy, but I think it says, you know, so much about us what we choose to, you think of like Tom Waits yeah, and yeah. his voice and his, all of that is like, or his look, it's like an external thing, but it says so much about you like look at him and the way he stands. We just watched, um, was it down by law? The movie that he Oh made? yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And he's just like ridiculously compelling just by his presence. He's so unique. And you wonder like what, how he became that, how he became that creature. Their slapping fight in the jail cell just makes me <laughs> fall off my chair laughing. It's, it's so hilarious, but it's also such a haunting, beautiful film. And you, you're absolutely right. By the way, I, I discovered that he's on LinkedIn a number of years what? ago. So I, uh, yeah. So I reached out now. I did some checking. I, I think it's really him. He lists himself for a profession. He lists himself as Ostrich farmer. <laughs> it's him. It's, it's for gotta sure. Him. It's gotta be him. Gotta be. I, gotta be I him. Also that I like didn't ever think LinkedIn was a thing, and now I'm like, oh, it's the greatest thing 
if he thinks it's great. If he <laughs> eats. <laughs> will, will the real Tom Waits, comma, ostrich farmer, please stand up and, yeah. and <laughs> identify yourself? Just out of curiosity, did you ever manage to get to like Rachel at all? She must have been the hardest to really get yeah. on a wavelength with. Totally. Uh, she felt the furthest for me by a long shot and continued to. But that grasping at her was such an exciting thing for me to do. And again, like similar to Helena, had this shadow underneath that was this, she was part of the system, but brainwashed to thinking she wasn't in the system, yes. thinking she was the exception, which to me reflects back to this idea of certain people thinking that they are outside of the cause of fighting for humanity, fighting for everyone's rights. Because, and I think a lot of women who voted for Trump think that they are exceptions to this, to his misogyny, or they want right. to ally themselves next to the power because it's safer. And so they compromise or think that they're outside of it. They couldn't be taken down. And I right. think for Rachel exists in that place of like I'm protected when really she's just a, a pawn. I, I don't recall when someone tried to explain to her how horrible Dyad is, for example, her saying fake news, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, now you oscillate back and forth between LA and in Canada. Mm -hmm. What is it like trying to explain your Canadianness to Americans, especially in the time of Trump? It's very strange to be there for sure. And I don't know. I think that there's, I don't feel so far away from what's happening there because it feels like maybe just the most noisy expression of what's really happening everywhere. Yeah. Similarly to Rachel, like if I were to say, I'm not, I'm as a Canadian, I don't actually exist in that system of what's happening in the States. I'd be lying and uh, I'd be in denial. I do yeah. think that Americans just do it louder than we do. And we have so many, and that's why Alani's, her work was so exciting to discover when we were on the jury and, and to see how she's shedding light on so many issues that we have in Canada and so many voices that haven't been heard. Absolutely. And, and I've, and you're speaking of Alanis Obamsuan, who you were part of the process of choosing to, to, to win the Glenn Gould prize. I've had a chance to speak with her now. I had about a 90 minute conversation with her last week and, and she is, just one of the most beautiful, pure spirits you can imagine. And considering all the things that she's lived through and seen and had to contend with, and she is so free of bitterness and prepared to still see the best in people or to look for it at least and allow that to find expression in her art and not not being Pollyanna-ish about it. Just if you try hard enough, there's a human being in there somewhere and they want to do the right thing. They just don't know it yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think about how an artist continues to, cre to create when they are told that they shouldn't or are, yeah. that they're, that's just so exciting. Exactly. Speaking of, of creating, do you see, I, I noticed you had some producing credits on Orphan Black. Do you mm -hmm. see more producing and possibly directing in the future? Yeah, I'd love to. I always have this block in my head because of my lack of plot brain where I'm like, how would I be able to, <laughs> to hold all those pieces? But I do love, I love actors and I love crew and I love everybody who creates on set. Or I, I just, I think what I have to get around is the fact that I'm, I don't know how to make choices. I like going with what feels, but to have to say two weeks before we're there on set, I right. want to have this for this or that. That's daunting to me for sure. I watched Two Lovers and a Bear, and that's an amazing film. It's so a a frosty Romeo and Juliet type story, but yeah. it, it you shot in in Nunavut and Timmins in Iqaluit and Timmins, yeah. Uh, and what was that experience like? And, and did you manage to avoid frostbite? We were wearing electric long underwear on set. We were freezing. It was so cold. I've never felt that kind of cold in like in Saskatchewan, but huh. I had the best time. I, I just loved Iqaluit so much. I loved the people. I loved the 
scenery. It was just incredible. I got on snowmobiles every day and went fishing. Like it was just incredible. And yeah, and working with Kim Nguyen was was so exciting. It's it's beautiful and it's that and it has a an a absolutely magical realist quality to it. Got really upset at the ending, but that was only because <laughs> I always get upset at Romeo and Juliet. It's, don't take I, the prize. Don't take. Don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't do it. Anything I've ever done, that's the one thing that my Oma just won't forgive me for is that last image. She's yeah. just, she's not okay with it at all. <laughs> I, I know it's so. Uh, it's it's a little hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, Woman in Gold. Now that one, I was going to say, what's it like uh, doing a film in your? Uh, actually, I should say, doing a film in your first language, right? Um, Very first, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I spoke German throughout that entire film and have had a history of learning German and speaking with my family and studying it in high school and university, but then playing a native speaker who speaks with a specific dialect and is of yeah. a certain class. All of that stuff contributed to it being way harder than... <laughs> yeah, and it, it really is two films in one it's so you probably i'm going to guess like never encountered and or interacted at all with helen mirren or ryan reynolds you you were with the, the vienna cast right yeah helen and i passed each other and and nodded and that was about it yeah but we were in vienna yeah. it's very persuasive it's really compelling and obviously you have these incredible sets and the historical backgrounds it must have been a trip to do yeah, to be filming in the locations where it actually took place and to be walking in the streets where these things would have happened was really, you can feel that resonance for sure. Absolutely. And then back onto stage, which is where you started, Network, that really was a, a unique production. You ended up out on the street for yeah. part of the show. The audience ended up on the stage eating literally like there was no fourth wall in fact there was no back wall either was that in a way even a bit scarier because you're in character and you basically are out in in manhattan on the street yeah. were you nervous going into that and how did it all feel in execution i feel like the, the those elements like having the audience on stage or the fact that we warmed up on stage before the show while the audience was filing in and they could watch us or going out into the street, those were the elements that were actually the most, they felt not the safest, but like the most true. Mm. There's so much artifice in like, we're going to go prepare backstage and then we'll present to you this thing and then we'll step away. And we okay. really hope you believe it. But if you break all of that down and you mess with what is real life and what isn't, not only is it thematically so important to network itself and to what was going on in terms of Trump and everything, it also just feels like you don't, as an actor, have that switch where it's like suddenly now I'm acting. And the same way as it was to be on stage and have camera suddenly in my face and suddenly I'm in a close-up. So before I was performing to a thousand people, now I'm in a close-up of just my face it also destroys that myth of there's a difference between a stage performance and a, and a screen performance. I think we're huge in life and that hugeness can live on camera in a real way. Most recently, you've been Sister of Al sister Alice. You've been an evangelist. And yeah. that must be, in a way, a, a different experience of theatrical power and the way that power can be both used and abused and also take possession of you what have you been been learning about performance per se through that role yeah i loved sister alice because she has this performance identity and then her private so there's a public and a private and we get access to both but the private life is even controlled becomes messily controlled by the public and her, the expectations on her as a public performer versus as a private person, it's, it feels really prescient in terms of everything right now, access to people's lives on the internet or whatever it is, that we never have enough of somebody. So it, that was really interesting. And just also what that religious fervor can do in terms of giving people in the crowd a sense of hope and belonging community, but also warp your mind. 
yes. into believing that whatever that this baby is raised from the dead or that this man can walk or and how the power of oratory can lead people to part with reality and do once they're in the palm of your hand terrible things i understand that you modeled her a little bit after amy semple mcpherson and she her heyday was the same time that hitler was doing the same thing with oratory across the the oceans that's a very dangerous power in a way. Yeah. And you think about, yeah, what it is to be part of a, a mob or a group that is listening to somebody affirm your greatest fears or your whatever and tell you that they're a safe haven. And also what was happening with Amy was that, that the world was in a very hopeless place. Yes. And needing, needing a boy in that, needing some kind of safety uh, place to go that they could feel like there was a chance at redemption right. or whatever. And I think she, she wore like furs and like expensive coats. And she was like a star at the same time as she was preaching humility. At least she didn't say make America great again. Or, uh, she did not. No, because she was from Canada. <laughs> that's right. She was a Canadian. Yeah. Um, but it also it puts you in a lineage of great actresses who have played evangelists. Barbara Stanwyck did one, Gene Simmons in Elmer Gantry. Did you reference any of those performances at all? No, but I, I did find that Faye Dunaway had played Amy Semple in, in a movie of the week. And I was like, oh, I'm just picking up Faye Dunaway's sloppy seconds. I can just play the characters uh, she's played. <laughs> well, movies of the week back then were often nothing to write home about. So That's I, <laughs> You're making a, a more memorable contribution. Yeah. Any hints about things coming up in the future once you're free to go out and about again and, and get back on set? No, yeah. the thing I've been doing during quarantine has been like what I think a lot of actors are doing, which is voiceover. And I did a cartoon called Harper House, which should be coming out soon. But it's or actually, I think they're just starting animation, but it was so much fun. And it was like such a joy to get to tap back into a super creative thing and still where my PJs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Would you like to do more of that? And because it's a medium, a lot of people think CGI animation, big Pixar type films, but it could be almost anything and it could go almost anywhere depending on who who's producing it, what the script is and who's animating. Totally. And I, I have like, I'm such a cartoon nerd. Like I just love cartoons and I have so much reverence for like voice actors, but also for animators and creators of cartoons who are pushing the boundaries of what what a world can look like what a person can look like what how we can tell a story bojack horseman did such incredible work with messing with our expectations of what a tv series could yep. be yet. there's this show called the midnight gospel that i just became nuts about early quarantine that just it breaks all of the conventions that you would expect and and just is the most absurd thing on the planet and right that's yeah i love that stuff and we all owe it a debt of gratitude to south park right totally yeah, yeah. totally absolutely i i remember yeah. when uh bigger longer and uncut came out there <laughs> their first feature which yeah. of course was the place of that the world learned to blame canada and <laughs> i was buying a copy in a best buy in upstate new york for for a friend and the clerk who was probably about 19 years old she stopped and said oh is that good and i said I saw it in the theater and I thought I was going to die. I laughed so hard. And she, said, <laughs> and she said, my father just loves that show. And I said, really, what does he do? He's a construction worker. And I thought <laughs> that that's amazing. That's amazing. In upstate New York. Yeah. So anyway, keep fighting the good fight. Keep exploring. Your work is amazing. And, and it's really been just a delight to, to chat with you. And when you have something new that you want to tell us about, you're always welcome to come back for, for another visit. We love you here. Keep coming back to Canada. Don't ever go away. I won't. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I had so right. much fun. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Tatiana. Bye-bye.